Michael Powell and Emmerich Pressburger had two very different backgrounds. They were very different people, but their collaboration was extraordinary. And many people feel that the difference between them is one of the things that made the collaboration so good. My name is Thelma Schoonmaker, and I'm a film editor. I work for Martin Scorsese, who has been obsessed with the films of Powell and Pressburger all of his life. And fortunately for me, he introduced me to Michael Powell uh, when we were making Raging Bull. And much to everybody's astonishment because of the difference in our ages, I was 45 and he was 74, um, we fell in love and uh, spent the next 10 years together before he died, the happiest 10 years of my life. Um, so I owe to Scorsese the best job in the world as his film editor and the best husband in the world. Michael was the son of a farmer who uh, raised hops in Kent, the county of England called the Garden of England, um, and had a very happy childhood on a farm, and then discovered the silent film uh, when his mother took him to see a silent film and always wanted to, to be part of it. Emmerich, on the other hand, had a much more difficult life. <laughs> he was born in Hungary, and then Hungary was carved up and became Romania, and then he studied a little bit in Prague and eventually made his way to Germany, um, living through very difficult times, starving half the time, sleeping on park benches until he broke into the German film business. Uh, because he was Jewish, he had to leave Germany when Hitler came to power. One day people came to the studio and just said, we have to fire anyone who's Jewish. So his life was very much more difficult than Michael's. That collaboration was extraordinary, and their friendship lasted until the end of their lives. Michael, uh, after he was trained at the Victorine Studios, came back to England and was shocked because instead of being embraced as he was by the American film crew in France, he found the unions and uh, things in, in the British film business much more difficult and not receptive. However, he did hook up with Alfred Hitchcock and worked with him on, on one of his films uh, briefly uh, and then got into what were called the quota quickies which were short films sometimes 40 minutes long. Michael cut his teeth on them but he hated them. He didn't feel they gave him any range as an artist. So after years of making these quota quickies he decided to give it up and gamble everything on making a film that came from his heart. He had read about the fact that some of the islands off of Scotland had to be depopulated because the people there could no longer sustain themselves. And it was a very sad story of these people having to leave these gorgeous, beautiful islands and go back to the mainland. So he decided to make a movie about this called Edge of the World, which celebrates the beauty of this uh, island in a very, very special way. And it was a real triumph that he ever got it made. He had to raise the money himself. He had to get people who would agree to go for a long period of time on this remote island. There was very little contact between the mainland and the island. It was dangerous if anyone got sick, for example. There was a boat that came once a week back and forth. There were no airplanes, no helicopters, no radio, no electricity. They used the people who lived on the island for many of the parts in the movie, but they brought in actors as well. We're dealing with a question that each one of us has got to face squarely. It's your home in our families, in our future lives. I'm an all right. They had to carry all their equipment up to astonishing crags that overlooked the pounding sea. And they just succeeded in making this wonderful, beautiful film, which I just love. Alexander Korda, the great Hungarian who came to Britain and made wonderful films like Henry VIII, had seen Edge of the World and was so impressed by it that he decided Michael was the person to make a film he wanted to make in Burma and he would send him off to do a location scout and he would come back and then World War II happened and that, that never occurred. But what did happen is that Korda put Michael Powell and Emmerich Pressburger together. So Emmerich Pressburger, who had had this terribly difficult life, moving from country to country always as an alien and finally uh, landing in England where he was not having much success. But fortunately, Corda's brother Zoltan Corda had introduced 
him to Alexander Corda. And Corda was having trouble with a script called Spy in Black. And he said to Emmerich, can you do something with this? And Emmerich came back with just a beautiful uh, idea for it. And so he said, all right, let's go into this script meeting where the original script writer was and all the people who were going to make the movie. And Michael Powell was there because Corda already knew that he would have to replace the director, he would have to replace the screenwriter, but he wanted everybody in the same room for the moment when it happened. And Michael Powell describes this astonishing thing that happened when Emmerich Pressburger had a tiny piece of paper that he unrolled, he had rolled it up, and on that piece of paper was a complete restructure of The Spy in Black, a brilliant way to save a bad script. And Michael was just stunned by this man listening to him and he thought, this is a man who understands movies. And so this wonderful collaboration began on Spy and Black. And interestingly, it was about Germans who on a submarine uh, land in a uh, northern part of England. And it was starring Conrad Veidt, a great, great German actor who had had to flee Hitler. The way the Germans are portrayed in the movie is uh, very startling because usually they had been portrayed in stereotyped ways and yet here, this charming, wonderful actor, you began to understand him and his problems. I beg your pardon? Your orders, Captain Hart. To report for duty to Follentil, to obey all her orders. Exactly. Now pick up your motorbike and go to bed. Spy in Black was very successful and Corda understood that he had found a great team it was the beginning of the way that Powell and Pressburger approached movies as a world cinema. This wonderful attitude about making films for the world instead of for Britain was something that Emmerich and Michael Powell were deeply devoted to. They made Contraband, starring Conrad Veidt and Valerie Hobson again, the same two actors who were in A Spy in Black. And the, the chemistry between them is, is really great. This time she's playing a Danish woman on a ship that is captained by Veidt. So that was also extremely successful. Michael and Emmerich decided to solidify their relationship and form a company called The Archers. Emmerich was upset that it might say a Michael Powell production on the opening titles. He felt that his contributions were so strong that he wanted to share the credit written, directed, and produced by Michael Powell and Emmerich Pressburger. And uh, in spite of opposition from a lot of people that Michael was told don't do it, he felt so strongly about Emmerich's enormous contributions to their films that he agreed to it, and it was quite startling in those days to have a credit like that. Then they launched into one of the greatest films they ever made. It's my personal favorite, <laughs> The Life and Death of Colonel Blimp, which astonishingly is about the friendship of a German and a Brit, which was made during the time when London was being pummeled by German bombs. How anyone at that time, except Powell and Pressburger, would conceive of doing something like this, it, it's, it's astounding. Most people would be making more cliched kind of uh, um, anti-German films, but they had a deep understanding that, again, it was the humanity of this man that was important to portray. Anton Wolberg, the great Austrian actor, plays Theo Kretschmar Schuldorf, a German officer. He was a human being just like Roger Livesey, who plays Clive Candy, the British general. The movie has some of the most amazing sequences in it. The favorite of Martin Scorsese and myself is a duel which is fought because Candy has insulted, supposedly, the uh, German army. So there's a long, long build-up to the duel, and you see the two men who've never met each other and are going to now duel to the death, supposedly. And there's a great moment when Roger Livesey looks at Anton Volbrook and just gives him a little smile. It's one of the moments in the film that I just adore. In spite of that, they become lifelong friends. The success of Colonel Blimp was so huge that the studio, the rank organization, started allowing 
Emmerich and Michael to make their own decisions about what movie they would make. The reason they created so many masterpieces during World War II is that they were left alone by the studio. I know where I'm going, which is one of the huge favorites of Paul Pressburger fans, for good reason, is actually one of the most romantic of the films they ever made. And it's set in Scotland, which is so beautiful. Their films were incredibly efficiently made. They cost nothing compared with what a movie today costs. They only took one take, usually, unless there was something wrong with the camera or the actor screwed up. But if you did, that would make Michael very angry. And at one point, there's a, there's a great line in the movie that Pamela Brown, a woman that Michael had a romantic relationship with, um, is uh, forced by Michael to do 15 takes because he doesn't like, there's something about the line that he doesn't like. And the line is... But money isn't everything. And he made her do it over and over again. And then 10 years later, he said to her, I know what was wrong. It was, it was the line. And she slapped him. <laughs> She was so upset because they were so disciplined in those days. The actors were working in the theater at night, making films during the day. They were so tuned up and so beautifully trained that you only had to do one take, usually. One of the things that allowed the British film industry to uh, continue during World War II, whereas it had been shut down during World War I, was that uh, Alexander Korda agreed with Churchill that if the filmmakers were contributing to the war effort in some way, that the film industry would be allowed to go on. And so uh, they had to go and ask the Minister of Information before every film what particular film they were going to make, and he either had to approve it or sometimes he would suggest films that he thought needed to be made. It was the end of the war, and he said, uh, we want you to make a film about how the Americans and the British should care more about each other. And this was one of those, a matter of life and death. It begins with a sequence that everybody loves, with David Niven in a plane filled with flames, and he's obviously doomed and will crash or parachute out. And the American, Kim Hunter, who is in the radio tower at the airport trying to help him. It's one of the most amazing sequences you've ever seen. And it's done so simply. And it's so powerful because it's just packed with emotion. Michael loved making the movie. It's his favorite because he could be a magician. He could create heaven and earth. And so heaven and earth are constantly being cut back and forth between. And Emmerich said, we have to make heaven black and white and earth in color. Jack Cardiff, the magnificent cinematographer, had been trained in the Technicolor lab, so he understood Technicolor very deeply. And he said, we'll make the black and white by using Technicolor, but we won't put the dyes on. And so the original nitrate prints have this beautiful pearly quality of what heaven looks like. And then when you come to earth, it's just this roar of color, which is, is gorgeous. Black Narcissus was startlingly made in England. It's just a rich evocation of India, but uh, Michael knew that if they went, it would be too expensive, too difficult. It was the end of the war. Everybody wanted to be home. And so they decided to shoot it all in England in a magnificent set designed by Alfred Junge. So all of that exotic Asian feeling was all done in England, which is really astounding. And then with visual effects, they created the feeling of the Himalayas behind them. Do you notice a change in us since we came here? I notice a change in you. Am I very different? Yes. You're much nicer. Nicer? Hmm. You're human. Human? Yes, we're all human, aren't we? Michael was not entirely happy about the movie, although it was very, very successful. It was based on a novel, and he felt that they were beginning to go astray from the beautiful original ideas they had. But it's a highly successful film. Won an Oscar for cinematography, one of the most beautiful films ever shot. The Red Shoes is an astounding artistic achievement. 
The story was originally written by Emmerich when Alexander Corder was married to Merle Oberon and he wanted a part for her. And he based it on the Hans Christian Andersen story about a woman who dances to death because she uh, desires these red shoes and the red shoes carry her to her death. He thought it would be a great part for Merle Oberon, but she was not a dancer. They would have had a double play the part. The film never got made because World War II broke out. So later, when after Black Narcissus, Emmerich said, why don't we try and revive this? And Michael said, only if a real ballerina plays the part. I will not have a double. And not only did he find the beautiful Moira Shearer, but he peopled it with real ballet dancers, and that's what makes it so vivid and believable. You come in on the second beat. Impossible. One, two, tia, tia. It's quite simple. You see this pattern? Yes. Well, follow it! Oh! The movie was hated by the rank organization. They had approved all the other films that Powell and Pressburger had made. Black Narcissus was a huge hit, but they were horrified by what they saw of these ballet dancers. They said, we are no longer gonna let you make films that you choose to make anymore. We will tell you what to make. And Michael and Emmerich said, nobody ever says that to us, and they left, which was the end of a wonderful period of filmmaking. Rank then tried to destroy the movie. They gave it no premiere. They put it out in the provinces briefly and then yanked it from distribution. However, two American filmmakers had seen it, Arthur Krim and Bob Benjamin. They had had big success with Colonel Blimp and Black Narcissus in America. And they said, well, we'll try and run it in America and see what happens. They rented a theater in uh, the Broadway area and converted it into a, a movie theater and it ran for two solid years. It made a fortune all around the world. Rank were just completely wrong. After the devastating uh, experience with Rank on the Red Shoes, uh, Michael and Emmerich left, and Alexander Corder was waiting in the wings. He had wanted to hire the archers for a long time. And so they went to work with him. Unfortunately, Corda had bought a lot of books that he wanted made into film so he could recoup the money he had spent on the rights for the book. And the films they made, which I love actually, uh, Michael again said, because they weren't the original ideas coming from Emmerich's beautiful mind, of uh, you could hear the crackle of the page, Michael said. But they're wonderful films, Small Back Room, Gone to Earth, um, Elusive Pimpernel, and Tales of Hoffman. After they finished Tales of Hoffman, things were not going so well for the British film industry. America would not allow a lot of their films in. Slowly, things began to collapse. Michael had ideas that were crazy and wild. He wanted to make movies in which Matisse was the, designed the sets, uh, Stravinsky did the music, Dylan Thomas wrote the script, and Orson Welles was in them. Well, I think Emmerich would, at that point in the British film industry, I think he thought, well, this is not very feasible. So they separated, and Michael tried for years to raise money to make movies and couldn't. And then Peeping Tom came along through Leo Marx, a very interesting writer who had been a code breaker during the war. I think Peeping Tom examines the power of art, the tremendous draw it has, but also some of the dangers of it. And Michael had to completely reinvent himself. He was working with a new writer, uh, and he knew that time had changed, that he didn't want to shoot movies the way he had been up to that point. The look of Peeping Tom is very, very different from all the previous movies, and it's a masterpiece. However, because of its subject matter, it was derided by the critics. The critics went to see it and just were horrified by it. People wrote reviews like, this should be flushed down the toilet, and the movie was removed from distribution by the distributor, and Michael was very angry about that. He said what they should have done is put an ad in the paper saying, this is what the critics are saying, come see for yourself. And he thinks the film would have survived. It was a devastating blow to his career. His career was over, suddenly, when he was in his early 60s. He never again was allowed to work in England, which is tragic when you consider what those two men did for the British film industry. 
And so gradually he fell into terrible poverty. He was at the end of his rope when up on the horizon <laughs> rode Martin Scorsese. Marty was coming to, I think, the Edinburgh Film Festival to get an award for Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore. And he loved the films of Powell and Pressburg. I don't think there's any director that has influenced him more than, than Michael Powell. He just could not get over the gutsiness and daring of the way Powell and Pressburg are made movies, the beauty of their images, their wonderful camera work, their editing, and the beautiful scripts. He went to Edinburgh and they said, who do you want to give you this award? And he said, Michael Powell. And they said, who's that? Had no idea who he was or where he was. So Marty then went to London and he kept saying to everybody, do you know where Michael Powell is and Emmerich Pressburger? Do you have? And finally the American, Michael Kaplan, who was doing publicity for 2001 for Kubrick said, I know where he is. Uh, he's living pretty poorly, but I'll arrange a lunch for you and him in Soho. And Marty and Michael met each other. And Marty re-entered Peeping Tom, which had um, never had a proper distribution in America, in the New York Film Festival, where it was a huge hit. People like Francis Coppola just couldn't believe it when they saw it. Pretty soon people were doing retrospectives of their work. The Museum of Modern Art did. Bruce Goldstein at the Film Forum ran long uh, uh, weeks of, of running some of the films. Michael was able to see it all come back which was amazing. I saw him standing in front of 18-year-olds who had just seen I Know Where I'm Going, and it was, you know, he, he saw it all come alive again. Emmerich was failing by then and didn't have the wonderful same experience. But um, to see them all come back is, it, it was, was just wonderful. Michael had given so much to Marty, he'd taught him how to be a director, and now Marty was able to give back. So now the Powell Pressburger films are lasting. That's what's so wonderful about them. I think because they, they weren't about topical subjects of the day. They were about human beings. There's an understanding of the world, which makes their films fascinating. There are many, many fans of them today, thanks to Marty and the British Film Institute. Audiences should watch these films because they're so unusual. You will be startled by what you see. I dare you not to look at them. You never know what's gonna happen next in them. They're so original, they're never cliched, they're never sentimental, they're packed with emotion. They're a roller coaster ride a lot of the time. These were great, great filmmakers who really knew how to use their tools and dazzle you.